speaker, let me know when I need to start. Go ahead, Nafi. Good morning, good afternoon, and evening to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, to our, our What Next uh, conversation. Today's session is called Commemorating uh, Beijing at 25. Uh, generation equality and bodily autonomy, empowering adolescent girls in the time of COVID-19. We want to carry this inspiring moment we had together at the Nairobi summit last November 2019 and forward into this year commemoration Beijing at 25. We wanted to ensure that we will have a dedicated space about the importance of the rights and power of adolescent girls. So to start our session today, we will play a video about the historic Nairobi Summit for ICPD at 25. of action recognizes that healthy families are created by choice, not by chance. The journey that began 25 years ago is far from over. It's now time to finish that unfinished business. The Sustainable Development Goals cannot and will not be achieved until women, girls and young people are able to control their bodies and their lives free from fear and from violence. We will never give up. We are in a race to the finish line, and we shall prevail. Thank you, Nashukuru Sana. We continue to carry this energy that we got in Nairobi, and we want to really be strong uh, in that energy this year for Beijing at 25 and for Generation Equality Forum. Uh, so today we have uh, the, also interpretation, international sign interpretation. We have live tube on, uh, in French, uh, Spanish, and English. And uh, you, of course, can choose uh, whichever language you want to follow. So welcome again to everybody. Our distinguished panelists today are uh, Dr. Natalia Kanem, United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of the United Nations Fund Population, the United Nations Population Fund. We do have the pleasure to have today uh, Madame Pamvile Blango Kuka. United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women, and uh, the big host and facilitator of the Beijing at 25. We have Her Excellency Madame Jean Keita, the Minister for Cooperation and African Integration of Guinea. We have Baroness Lisek. Minister for Sustainable Development and of the United Kingdom, Special Envoy for Girls' Education, and Baroness Seg is also 
Parliamentary Under Secretary of State in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the Department for International Development. We have Honorable Rachel Shebesh, Chief Administrative Secretary in the Ministry of Public Service, Youth and Gender of Kenya. We have Mr. Carlos Acosta, High-Level Advocacy Co-Chair of the Youth Coalition for Sexual and Reproductive Rights. We have Mr. Hans Linde, President of the Swedish Association for Sexuality Education. And we have two adolescent girls, Rashana Sunar from Nepal, founder of IDEA Nepal, and Rim El Shafai, advocate for gender equality, medical student, and white peer educator in Egypt. And of course, we will have the beautiful music and, uh, you know, and call for action of uh, GK Juneyi, an award-winning singer from China. So we have an exciting and full agenda. And without further ado, I would like to invite our first two speakers to kick off our first round of questions. And the, we wanted to start by reminding the youth voices and the voices of the survivors in realizing the Beijing and ICP agenda. So Roshana, you escaped child marriage at age 15 uh, married the man of your child at 23. And for the last seven years, you have been working to end child marriage and have stopped more than 37 child early and forced marriage in Nepal. Can you tell us more about this experience and what does bodily autonomy mean for you? Over to you, Roshana. Thank you very much for providing me this opportunity. Yes, I am a human rights activist. I'm working to end child marriage in Nepal. Behind the reason of my work, it reflects my own story. I was forced to marry tough when I was just 15. I wanted to study and live my life independently. So I was very desperate. Without my any involvement in the decision of my own wedding, I was asked to get ready to become a bride, which was not acceptable at all. So I had to go on list of my own family and I said no to the child marriage. Luckily, I escaped from the child marriage and remained at school. Since then, I realized the power of speaking up and the power of freedom. Then I took each day as a grand day to raise awareness of the of child marriage. I started having a dialogue with young girls and door-to-door -door campaign to raise awareness about bad consequences of child marriage and how we can end that harmful practice of child marriage. Because I believe child marriage forced girls into domestic violence, physical and mental health torture. And it also exposed them to marital rape and sexual harassment, which may lead them to have depression and suicide. Not only that, the girls may face the high risk of premature pregnancy relating to miscarriage, child mortality, aversion, and uterus collapse, and other health consequences. So child marriage is a violation of human rights, and it eliminates any possibilities of bodily autonomy. So this is very important that we have to keep our girls safe and stop the child marriage. Therefore, I would like to ask all of us to come together to stop the child marriage. And since past seven years, we have stopped more than 80 child marriages and we have sent 50 girls back to school and we are raising awareness around more than 10,000 young girls and boys visiting different schools, schools to schools, aiming that one day we can imagine of a society where no girls are forced to child married and forced to rape and sexually harassed. And they can be easily value, valued as as male and as boys in the society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashana. And this is impressive result that you are doing there in Laliguras 
and La Liguras means a rhododendron, which is a national flower of Nepal. And we are seeing that this flower is blooming uh, in uh, Nepal under your leadership. So thank you so much. Uh, so thank now you. I will turn to uh, Rim, uh, Rim El Shafai, uh, who is also a responsible for the YP educator. So Rim, uh, please uh, let us uh, tell us a little bit about your story and uh, what means bodily autonomy for you in Egypt. Okay, uh, first of all, it's such an honor to be here, like virtually. As a survivor, uh, activist, and medical student, I try every day to support girls around me and to empower them by telling them and letting them know that when it comes to their bodies, the first and the last choice should be their choices. And that's simply what body autonomy means to me. It's my right and every girl's right to have control over their bodies without any external influence or power over hair. And it should be for everyone with no discrimination based on age, gender, or uh, religion, uh, or nationality. Especially when it comes to girls and young women who have to face every day multiple forms of gender-based violence such as female genital mutilation, which millions of girls around the world have to face every day. It's very fundamental human right. And it's not only about preventing harmful practices such as forced marriage or FGM, but also about being able to make a very critical decision when it comes to your sexual and reproductive health. For example, each woman has the right to choose family planning methods that suit her best. Through different uh, NGOs like White Fear, we have managed through many trainings to spread our message to 34,500 trainees. Through, and through social media, we have reached to a million and a half audience only in 2019. But unfortunately, the pandemic came and we knew that we have to do something to complete our awareness campaigns. So we started a program called White Fear uh, Geniuses, and I was so honorable to be the host of that uh, program. And it was a competition in a form of competition among youth from all over Egypt. And the questions was about general knowledge along with GBV and SRH, so we could refresh the memory of our members. A report for the UN say that six months of coronavirus lockdown could mean 31 million more cases of domestic violence. And that number is so horrific. So we started to take an action and we started an initiative, that initiative called Ma'abad or Together. And that initiative started to highlight the danger that coronavirus has put many women in since the beginning of COVID-19. We started to talk about issues like domestic violence and abuse, emotional uh, manipulation, emotional abuse, how the survivor could ask for help and uh, how they can be saved. And we started also to talk about mental hygiene and how can we avoid an anxiety that comes along with them. Thank you so much, Reem. And uh, I will turn again to uh, Rahana, Roshana. Uh, Roshana, uh, we want just to hear what, how do you see the future? Uh, regarding, you know, uh, girls, adolescent girls like you living in that remote area of uh, Nepal at risk of flooding every year. Uh, how do you see your role as women leaders, you know, and how do you want to build this uh, future? Over to you. Roshana? Hello? Yes, Roshana. I'm working as the head of the Idea Nepal, which aims to end child marriage and violence against women and girls. So as I um, talk about the bodily autonomy, in Nepal's official enactment of bodily autonomy um, of Safe Motherhood and um, Reproductive Health Rights Act 2018, which was endorsed by our president, Bida Devi Bandari, which is absolutely a big achievement for Nepali girls and women. But the fact we are lacking to have sufficient implementation of those written legal framework and provisions. So there are still girls and women who are not even aware about their bodily autonomy and their basic human rights. 
So as I lead my community, I hope for a future of that society where girls and women are safe. Because recently there was a woman in quarantine camp at this COVID-19 pandemic. She was raped by a group in the quarantine camp. And there is a woman who had to give birth to eight children because of the son preference. She kept giving birth until her uterus was collapsed. These are just an example because I know in my community, there are still many girls and women who need legal support, who need a voice on behalf of them because they are voiceless and powerless. So one of my work is to have a dialogue because I believe having a dialogue is the way of breaking the silence. When we talk, we can finalize the solution itself. So we are working to invest in girls' education. Now we also run a school for um, children care because the young mothers who are aged 19 years old, 18 years old, and they have children, but I see the possibility in them, they can still go back to the school or learn some income generating skills so they can run small businesses and be financially, socially, emotionally independent so they can raise their children in a better way. Therefore, we are running that school. It provides free scholarship and happy scholarship for those children coming from marginalized background. Especially those children are the children of forced child bride. So we take care of them during the daytime and we send young mothers to fly high, to dream big, so they can live their life in a happy way. Thank Therefore, you. thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rashana, for sharing this. And uh, Rim, I would like to ask the same question uh, in one minute, you know, about the future uh, for girls in Egypt, adolescent girls in Egypt. Rim, over to you. Okay, the future I imagine is a future where all girls are truly empowered. Their voices are really heard. Actually, I really do believe that women are so strong, but that power will be unleashed once the world starts to perceive the meaning of strength in a different way. For me, in my story, education has saved literally my life. In my story, thanks to my mom, as she was the first generation, among the first generation of women that was able to go to college in her family, she, by education, she was so empowered that she protected us, her daughters, from FGM. That horrific act that she and many other children have, has to face during their childhood. The key action that I will try to take is that I want to continue working with you, dear, because I really believe in severe education. It's so, and it's so infectious. I will give every support to any initiatives that, start, that try to give any empowerment to any woman or girl around the world, especially those initiatives that try to engage other lessons in the change-making policies. And uh, Parliament try to break the cycle of this. We have to remember to leave no behind every girl that has faced the consequences of violence or any harm acts need to hear that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rim. I think we have lost a little bit of your connection. And uh, do, I'm going to uh, thank the two, our two uh, young women uh, today uh, who were, uh, you know, uh, sharing their voices, you know, on behalf of, uh, you know, millions of adolescent girls in the world. And uh, we would like now to uh, move to uh, Dr. Natalia Kanem. Dr. Kanem, uh, last year, uh, the Nairobi summit was convened to celebrate ICPD at 25, and now the world is being plagued, plagued by the pandemic, which is having a devastating impact. How is UNFPA working to ensure that the sexual and reproductive health and rights of adolescent girls, including bodily autonomy, is guaranteed, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic? Over to you, Dr. Kanel. Thank you so much, Nafi. And First of all, I wanna thank you, Roshana and Reem. Today, I'm having one of my favorite discussions, 
last year on the road to Nairobi, I asked what's changed. We saw things changed, but not fast enough. And this year I'm asking what's next. So our discussion today, which already has hundreds of participants, by the way, so welcome everyone. Generation equality and bodily autonomy empowering adolescent girls in the time of COVID has had two fantastic young women who've shown us the power of the adolescent girl. That's a power that you've given us your examples. And I thank you. It's an example of freedom to study, freedom to be able to say no, freedom to choose, freedom to speak out. And you've done that very well today. And I think for every adolescent girl, we've got to shape a world after COVID where she is free to fulfill her potential. So thank you to all of our other fantastic panelists and to the fantastic interpreters for the deaf community that's so important to us. And most of all, thank you to the leader of you and women during this year of 2020 when we are celebrating Beijing 25, but also creating these coalitions and generation equality is a great vehicle. I'm really proud that Madame Pumzile is with us today. Welcome, Pumzile. So I would say that when we talk about the adolescent girl, we typically look at her as somebody who is vulnerable, disempowered. That's got to change. And already we've seen examples of the power of networking, YPIR, AFRIAN, all of the coalitions in Latin America, and now our bigger generation equality coalitions that are determined to make bodily autonomy something that we forge ahead and build back better about. These are brave voices. I'm sure it wasn't easy for you, Roshana and Reem, to do what you've done, but this is also part of our commitment as UNFPA. Our strategy, working with the rest of the United Nations, is call, calling to address issues of young people through the rubric of my body, my life, and my world, because it is your world. So in supporting girls to reclaim their bodies and to be able to ensure that they have unobstructed access to things that they need. Sexuality is a part of life. Unfortunately, it's not a happy, healthy sexuality in many situations. So we have to stand up so girls are not coerced. We have to make sure that girls have the information they need about reproductive health. That education for girls and boys for that matter is part of the skills that get you through life that help you to make a decision based from a position of power. Now, um, respect for each other also means that we should not exploit a girl's situation. Child marriage is one extreme example. Female genital mutilation is another very extreme example. So for the past uh, 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 decade and more, UNFPA, UNICEF, UN Women, so many of us are working together for human rights. And that includes the rights of an adolescent girl. I'm happy that we've been able to facilitate difficult conversations to bring in parents who once they understand the physical and the psychological risk to this young girl growing into her womanhood can add their power to the equation to protect her. So I think during COVID-19, young people are some of the most important partners we have to envision that world made new. We're not gonna give up on Agenda 2030. We actually now have to accelerate what we're doing. So we get there on time, even if COVID makes our life harder in the short term. Now we can use our imagination and make sure that when we build back better, the adolescent girl is well protected and empowered in that equation. Back to you, Nafi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kanem. Thank you uh, for your leadership and for your passion. And I will turn to Madame Fendili first by saying happy anniversary to you and women. Uh, we are so happy, uh, you know, and we, we and the partnership is fantastic, really. Uh, and you're moving, you're moving the needle. So, uh, Madame Fendili, this year marks Beijing 25, and uh, you and women is coordinating the Generation Equality Forum. And you all call us, you know, all of us, you know, to be part of that. How is adolescent girls' bodily autonomy 
are critical for their rights and achievement of gender equality. Over to you, Madam. Madam Pumzile, can you put your video on if it's going to? Okay, great. Yeah. You're still mute, Pumzile. Unmute. Peter, can you help to unmute? Okay. <laughs> Always doing the best. I'm trying to, and um, she's not. Okay, good. Great. Okay. So, am, uh, am, am I audible? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> From South thank Africa. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for this uh, opportunity. And uh, congratulations, uh, UNFPA. Congratulations, Natalia, and the whole UNFPA. Uh, family for putting together this conversation. Cairo and Beijing are twins. Uh, we have been up and down and sideways together, championing the cause of women and girls. And I'm glad that more and more, the understanding of the importance of uh, intergenerational leadership, co-creation with young people is gaining ground. And thanks to the work that you, UNFPA, have been championing to make this possible. I think uh, the pushing on comprehensive sexual, uh, comprehensive sexual education under really difficult times uh, has been groundbreaking and I think has shifted the needle, which means that uh, we need to continue to do more and not to do less. And this is going to be part of what I'm sure we can do in generation equality. Uh, bodily autonomy and integrity for girls and for any woman is central. It's just who you are, how you look, what you wish to do with yourself. It's your freedom to be regal. It's your freedom to be present, to own the space. It's psycholo psychological, it's spiritual, it's about your health. It's about nurturing your intellect. All of these are important and we must never let anyone tell us this is not important. In generation equality, we see girls and young women uh, as the core and central to this endeavor of taking the work of Beijing uh, forward. But also we know that this work can only be done if we are together with UNFPA in addressing all of the issues that we know so much about these days that deny women sexual and reproductive rights. One of the themes of generation equality, indeed, it is a, a bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive rights and health. I mean, bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights, which UNFPA is going to be anchoring and leading. Just because UNFPA is going to be leading, it does not mean that all of us are off the hook. We have to be there because we have to connect this theme with the other themes of generation equality so that we make it holistic. So I look forward to this collaboration and I look forward to the leadership and the presence of young people. And I'm glad that today we have the Youth Coalition for Sexual and Reproductive Rights on, uh, uh, on this call also participating. Thank you so much and uh, bravo UNFPA. Thank you so much uh, Pandili and uh, bravo to you and uh, bravo to your courage. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I will turn to uh, Her Excellency Minister Diene Keita. Bonjour Diene. Uh, Diene, in your view, uh, what are some positive actions in your country, Guinea, that have been spearheaded to empower adolescent girls and their bodily autonomy, including uh, towards ending harmful practices? Jenny, over to you. Merci beaucoup. Um, Honorable Baroness, sir, nice to see you. 
so nice to see you here. Um, Dr. Kanem, nice to see you as well. And Madam Pumzile, nice to see you. Uh, how are you, Nafi? And I'm everyone fine. online. I'm very privileged and proud to be among you today in my current function before stepping down. And I will take only one data if you allow me, just one, just one. Uh, in Guinea, according to a study made in 2016, 80% of young women and girls from age 15 to 64 have been victim of rape or violence, 80%. So that's where we come from. So what we do is a lot and an amount in imaginable work. Let me take a few. Let me go from uh, 6 February, the FGM day, when the president stood up in front of religious leader to ask them very politely to, take, to cut the crap out of it, that girls need to be girls. And the texts are following that. Our new constitution text on the human capital is following that. On 8 March, he exactly did the same, took the floor out of the hand of the acting social minister and said to the people, I want no child marriage in this country anymore. We are getting somewhere, but we all know that text, legislative texts are something and the practices are other things. And one thing we are working on is to make the difference between cultural and tradition and re religio religious practices, which are very different. And they're really mixing up uh, the way women and uh, the girl child are being treated in the country. So a lot of work is being done on that. But to reply to your question, where we stand today is the following. Because this conversation, I found it so useful. What next after the fantastic Nairobi summit? And while we are celebrating and commemorating Beijing 25, it's an incredible time for all of us. Because before being the world leaders we are, we are human beings. We are human beings, so we live through this. So what can we do to help shape uh, the post-pandemic world? For me, that's a very important question to ask myself as a leader, but to ask myself as a mother and as a human being. Well, it's not to write uh, what I see everywhere now, a new normal. There is no new normal. The right normal, the decent normal, that's what we're here for, the, the right normal. And that uh, right normal is what? That right normal for me is, how do you call it? The right to self-govern yourself. If you can't govern your own body, who would you like to govern later on? I don't know. And this is a fight that needs to be taken now, that is being taken now, and that we should be all fighting. That's what the new normal, the decent, the right normal will be about. And while doing that, the political, to make sure that the political commitment of Nairobi are a match with the financial commitment at the country level, domestic resources being put into that. So our COVID fighting plan are really working on that. Thanks to the SDG 17, we don't mention it very often, but thanks to SDG 17, the UN family with the lead of UNFPA, the rep is in my office right now, hi Barbara. And uh, we are, they are doing really a fantastic job. And to add to that, because there is no UN women office in Conakry, but we have the regional office very active and we work together, always in contact, doing their part as well. So I, I really wanted to mention that that is important for us. So once the government work, to make sure the financial and political comment uh, follow. But to make sure that the young people like Rachana and Rim are sitting on the table so they can judge. They are the one, they are the victim, they have been there, they know, and they still have a big life to live. And at last, those young people, I need them to do something else for me. Is to play big brother, big sister to the younger generation first and to help their own parents to change their mind of uh, their minds set. It is important. When, when my son talks to me, I listen. 
because we are not from the same generation. And Madame Pumzile, just for your information, he's a he for she for more than five years now. And he's listening for YouTube. And I think that's very important. I'm very proud of that. He's born in 94, so he's an ICPD child. And totally he for she. And this depends on the parent. So Rachana, Reem, and all of you out there, we need you to play big brother and big sister to your younger one to be following, to be reporting, and also to tell your parent what should be done. I think I, I don't want to take um, a lot of time on this, but this conversation for me is just a way to engage as a government leader with all my colleagues, uh, taking care of those issues on the ground every day, social affairs, uh, health minister, and women rights ministers to make sure that they follow what we all decided together. And uh, uh, the last point I want to make, I'm very proud to have signed along with Baroness Sag and others that commitment, that joint statement on sexual reproductive rights. And in Africa, we have only seven, six ministers that have signed it and seven countries. And I'm very proud that the African Union leaders of Africa signed it, really hooray. And in my region here, my president is the chairperson of the Mano River organization. We have three countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Cap Verde who have signed as well. There is so much to go for Africa, but at least it's the first step and every one of us in our region will do our best to make sure that the rest follow. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Keita. Thank you, Minister Keita. And uh, if we have time, we would like to have you again, you know, a few minutes. Uh, and uh, thank you for your leadership also uh, in uh, Guinea and in the Mano River uh, and uh, making, you know, a big difference for African and West African uh, population. I will uh, turn to uh, Baroness Seg. Uh, and uh, you, Baroness Seg, uh, you are championing uh, sexual reproductive health and rights, and you are co-leading the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence. Uh, as we see cases of violence spiking during COVID-19, including among marginalized adolescent girls, such as those with disabilities, uh, just to name some of the vulnerable group, uh, what will it finally take for all adolescent girls to live free of violence. Over to you, Baroness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nafi and Talia, for inviting me to this really important conversation today. It's great to be here. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate Dien on her appointment as Deputy Executive Director at UNFPA. We've been so impressed by your leadership on SRHR, and we really look forward to working with you at UNFPA. I'm really pleased that the UK has been chosen by UN Women to co-lead the Action Coalition on GBB with some fantastic partners. So thank you, Madame Simzili. Uh, we're excited, really excited about this opportunity to drive progress on preventing GBB over the next five years. And the issue is, of course, ever more urgent as we hear report after report about increases in violence faced by women and girls all over the world. Um, you know, during this pandemic. And it's truly horrifying, but sadly not surprising. I'd like to thank UNFPA for your really powerful State of the World Population Report this year, which focuses on harmful practices. And it shows that it's never been more pressing to act, to support and to empower women and girls, to, to fiercely protect and promote their rights, and to tackle the harmful social norms that really drive the violence and abuse. So as co-leader of the Action Coalition on GBV, we are going to take an evidence-based and intersectional approach. And our UK flagship What Works to Prevent Violence program really demonstrated that VORG is actually preventable. And we want to use this evidence to really drive concerted, coordinated global action across the international system to prevent and address violence against most marginalized women and girls, and with a particular focus on adolescent girls. And of course, we want to listen to adolescent girls as well as part of co-chairing this coalition. And I think uh, Rashina and Reem really showed the importance of listening to young people's voices today. We will be completely unwavering in our defence and promotion of adolescent girls' sexual and reproductive health and rights. And we know, as we heard from Rashina and Reem, that enabling girls to realise their SRHR is fundamental to their ability to lead healthy lives and to fulfil their potential. 
So the evidence clearly points us uh, towards what we need to do. We must get to the root of these issues. We have to change the way society values girls. We need to ensure that they have access to quality education, to health services and to opportunities, and ensure that their rights are respected and that they can be realised. And it's a hard task, of course, but crucially, we know it's not impossible. So we're looking forward to getting stuck in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baroness Fek, and thank you so much for the support of the, uh, the United Kingdom to uh, the UN agency, and now we name UN Women, UNFPA. We really appreciate your support. Uh, then I will turn to uh, Honorable Shebesh from uh, Kenya. Uh, so, Honorable Shebesh, Kenya has co-hosted the Nairobi Summit to commemorate ICPD at 25, and your president is leading a commitment to protect adolescent girls' bodily autonomy from female genital mutilation. Can you tell us a little bit about this commitment and how this is challenged in the current COVID-19 pandemic? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, thank you to everybody else who is on the panel. I'm happy to see you, especially see, since the ICPD in Nairobi, which we are honored to host. Uh, yes, our president did make a commitment to end um, FGM by 2022. 2022 also tallies with the end of his term. So he decided that ending FGM is part of his legacy. And since that pronouncement that he made also in Vancouver in Canada, we have uh, engaged robustly uh, with this uh, system. Because our country is one of the countries that has an, an FGM policy as, law, as well as legislation, uh, the president was clear that uh, the law must be followed. And therefore, FGM is illegal. So the first thing the president did was to invite cultural leaders and spiritual leaders so that the notion that this is cultural or spiritual is dealt with at that level. He then tasked us with uh, uh, my cabinet secretary, Professor Margaret Cobia, to engage robustly with the provincial administration. Now, the provincial administration in Kenya is the administration that goes up to the grassroots level. And that's where we find our chiefs and assistant chiefs. And we have 22 counties out of 47 that have FGM. And we have visited these counties through the support of UNFPA. We have been able to speak not only to the cultural and spiritual leaders, but directly to their chiefs and assistant chiefs. And when we speak, we read the law. And since we started doing this with my cabinet secretary, we have been able to arrest some chiefs and assistant chiefs who were part of the problem. And that's why the president said we target at that level, because those are the people who know every homestead, which girl lives there, whether she's going to school and whatever has happened. So it has worked for us, but with the onset of COVID-19, and I'm sure this has been experienced everywhere, the fact that schools were closed and safe houses were also closed, we, the girls were again exposed uh, to the uncertainty of being within their homes, especially those who had been rescued. So we did see a surge again in FGM. What also worried us is the medicalization of the scene, that uh, uh, cleverly now uh, using nurses and clinical officers especially in the small clinics you find in the rural areas, for example, or in the urban areas, that is where now the FGM was happening. And so we now included uh, the leadership, uh, the director, the medical director there, the head nurse, and we also read the Riot Act because in our uh, law, there is clear uh, punitive uh, measures that are taken. And so we, had ha we have had to in include that in terms of medicalization. Cross-border also becomes a problem. But the president himself intervened with our with the leadership, uh, his, 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 uh, the presidents or uh, leaders of government who we border where there is cross-border FGM. He has done it directly. And so we are also stemming the cross-border. But what I can say is that because we always have good policy, many countries, I can say almost with confidence, that have policy and have, have, have anti-FGM laws, the trick is to go to the ground and see what is really happening. Because if we have all these good policies and legislation that is not being implemented, then we cannot call it success. And that was the method the president 
gave us directly. And so we are constantly on the ground. Myself, I have been on the ground with UNFPA now, I think for the last three weeks. And because of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, we have had to you know, do more vid visits where it is happening. So I would say that the president's legacy could have been interfered with by COVID and the pandemic, but uh, we, we need to know that we have to surpass that and we still need to keep the commitment. So we are not going to use the excuse of COVID to say that, uh, you know, now we can do much. We can do much. Government never stops working, even if the rest of the economy is closed down, government can never sleep. So UNFP have really assisted us also with the upsurge of the girls who have gotten pregnant. We have ridiculous numbers of young girls after schools have closed from 13, 14, 15, getting pregnant. Why are they getting pregnant? Because they are with the economy down and their parents probably not being able to put food on the table. They feel guilty even asking for sanitary pads, for soap, you know, all the things that got me. So UNFPA has given us dignity packs that we are able to take to the most vulnerable. And using those dignity packs, we are repli replicating the same, talking to the county government at the level that they are, to look at making sure that young girls continue to have sanitary pads and the things that they need, so that they don't go to the next man or young man and get compromised. So again, that is something we are doing uh, collectively. But just to say that we continue with the commitment of ending FGM by 2022, and those are the measures we are using. And we hope that uh, we can get more measures that other countries are using, or that you can also learn from our experience. I thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, learning from each other and learning from your fantastic experience and uh, commitment in uh, Kenya is uh, also what we are to really trying to do. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable. Uh, I will turn now to our two male uh, um, in the panel and uh, Carlos, Carlos Acosta from Colombia, uh, Youth Sexual and, uh, you know, the Youth Coalition for Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. So Carlos, can you tell us a little bit about young people uh, in the world that are standing up for social justice and for justice for women? What are these young people calling for and what are the actions that you are taking to protect and support adolescent girls' bodily autonomy and gender equality? Over to you, Carlos. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me here and thank you for all of the panelists for sharing their stories. Um, to start with, I believe that COVID-19 definitely has been a time of awakening uh, for the young population because nothing has been more effective to show those disparities that we face uh, than the current pandemic. And we no longer see those um, inequalities because we're living them. They are not in the theory anymore. They are in our lives in every day. And this is particularly relevant for women adolescents and girls because besides the economical impact that we have in our economy and, and healthcare system, there's also a social loss. And this social loss is tremendously relevant uh, because we're losing the culture, the education and the human well-being. And these factors become definitely relevant when trying to build a community and build that uh, social network that women need in order to succeed within uh, this population. So, um, how can we engage like with with communities when there might not be one in the aftermath of the of the pandemic so the wake up call has been for an intergenerational approach in dealing with uh, society issues and we must stand by the youth side and uh, the adolescent girls and young women no. we can also contribute um, to the present. And young people right now are not calling for grants or, or favors. We are calling for meaningful involvement in decision-making um, processes, at least over our, ourselves. And this is how we open the floor for equity and autonomy. Um, I can say that we can start supporting women and girls by accessing education, healthcare, social protection, uh, but these are not new. So I do think that we must engage in changing the patriarchal and supremacy based system. And this is how we will bring new innovation um, uh, social policy to the, the discussion of poverty and violence. So this is a system that has been um, allowing these issues and that is why we want to confront it with um, comprehensive information, uh, body autonomy, strategies that address austerity, 
access to equity in essential services, including SRHR, and uh, if we want to really combat this. So we are advocating, we're raising our voices, but we are much more than that. We are creating food networks, technology innovation solutions, uh, policy proposals, building shelters for people who cannot social distance. We are much more than a single face student, and we also represent an active member in the sustainability ecosystem. So if the question is like how to start and what we can do, a good place is to share the table and look in the eye and recognize that we are part of the solution and not a box in the checklist. Thank you so much, Carlos, for sharing. I mean, I remember when I was your age, I was more interested in party. I'm so impressed by what you are doing. Thank you so much. And I will turn to uh, Hans. Uh, Hans, uh, it's, um, we'd like to hear a little bit uh, what, what you're doing in terms of uh, comprehensive sexual education in uh, Sweden. You are a fantastic champion. So please uh, tell us a little bit, you know, how, uh, you know, we can, uh, and adolescent girls, you know, can uh, have control over uh, one's body and what your organization is doing in that adolescent girl's bodily autonomy over hands. Thank you so much, Nathie, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of this important conversation. Uh, RFSU, the Swedish Association for Sexuality Education, we have been working for sexual and reproductive health and rights since 1933. We do it through mobilization and through political advocacy. We do it through uh, partnership with other civil society organizations at the local level, at the national level or international level, and through our peer-to-peer -peer educators. Last year, our educators met with over 20,000 students here in the Swedish schools. And I must say from, from our experience uh, that I would re really like to underline the importance of comprehensive sexuality education in empowering adolescent girls. If we want all girls and women to have the right and the freedom to make informed decision, uh, decisions about their life and health, it is essential that they have access to information and to open positive and non-judgmental conversations about their body, their sexuality, their relationship based on the needs and the questions of the adolescents. And we all know that comprehensive sexuality education is a core component in empowering adolescent girls to prevent SDIs and unintended pregnancies. But comprehensive sexuality education is also important to communicate key messages about human rights, about gender equality, consent and pleasure. We know that comprehensive sexuality education has the potential to change norms surrounding gender and to prevent and reduce gender-based violence, harmful traditional practices and discrimination. And I will just take a, a small minute to share with you one of um, our and one example for, of our work. In 2016, we received a number of reports of sexual abuse and violence in music festivals in Sweden. Many young women expressed that they didn't feel safe or secure uh, going to a concert. So we in RFSU, we teamed up with the organizers of the festivals and the police to address these challenges and take the conversation about gender equality norms and consent to the festivals. So we started training the people working in the festivals to ensure that they had tools to be active bystanders uh, in case of abuse and violence. And our educators went as well to the festivals to talk about sex, communication, boundaries, and mutuality. And our work proved to be very successful. Independent evaluation has uh, have shown that our work has contributed to changing norms and attitudes and has dramatically decreased sexual violence and abuse in our music festivals. So to conclude, I, I must say that I believe that our experience really underlines the power of information, the power of knowledge and open conversations about health, sexuality and rights, and, and also why comprehensive sexual education is a key component in accelerating the promises given in Beijing and Cairo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans, for being a big and strong supporter. And uh, congratulations again for your award in Nairobi for this uh, fantastic work that you're doing. Uh, so I will, uh, we will have a kind of break now with someone coming from China and uh, singing in Yi, 
Uh, I would like to uh, call uh, GK Juni, who is a uh, so beautiful activist uh, for adolescent girls. Uh, GK uh, is going also to share with us a video that she specifically, uh, you know, did for this event and for uh, you know adolescent girls' bodily autonomy. So, uh, GK, uh, over to you, please. Can you just uh, give a Thank you, Nafi. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Ji Ke Jun Yi. I'm a singer from China. As a little girl, I grew up in an ethnic minority community in a remote village in southwestern China. Today, I have the privilege to create and share inspiring music with the world. And I feel incredibly lucky and proud. Looking back, I see many struggles I had to overcome because I am a woman. And people pay more attention to my weight and what I'm wearing rather than who I truly am. However, I am grateful that I have worked with so many strong women who give me the strength and inspiration to move for the to inspiration to move forward with the opportunities that I blessed with as an artist. When I travel the world, I see women from all ethnicities facing challenges of inequality. Their lack of access to education and basic rights to make their own decisions. When people, when people look at successful women, it is very common for them to neglect their talents and efforts and assume that they either come from wealthy families or that they are supported by some powerful men. Instead of seeing them for who they are as independent individuals, the doubts and prejudice against me along the way only fueled me to become the strong-minded and independent woman I am now. Today in China, more and more women have achieved success in their career as well as in their personal lives. The song that I sing today is called Mu Nian. It is in Yi language. And it is about the love given to us by mother nature that is equal, pure, inclusive, and unbiased. The kind of love that all people, regardless of their genders and races, should receive and give back to the world. At last, I would like to end my speech with a wonderful quote by UNFPA Executive Director Dr. Natalia Kadam on her International Women's Day speech. She's also here with us. Let's carry forward the goals of the feminists who came before us in partnership with those who uphold feminist ideals today. We are all, we are all generation equality. It is up to us to secure gender equality once and for all. Thank you, and now please enjoy my music. This song is for all girls who hold a dream, who want to love and be loved. This song is for you and FPA who are fighting for an equal world.
GK for this beautiful, beautiful song. And I want to remember everybody listening on YouTube and, uh, you know, connected with us today that uh, you can, uh, you know, use WhatsApp. And so we are using what is next. What is next is our hashtag today. And please uh, post uh, this beautiful video, uh, you know, in, uh, that uh, GK has done for us. Uh, thank you so much, GK. So what is next? Please tweet. And uh, I will go for a very quick round of questions uh, for uh, uh, starting with Fandile. And uh, Madame Fandile, if you are still connected, we just want to hear in one minute, uh, you know, what uh, can ensure the adolescent girls that are furthest behind are rich irrespective of race, age, ability, location, or ethnicity. Over to you, Madam Pandil. Um, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the beautiful music. Wow, wonderful. <laughs> um, you know, if, even before COVID, uh, the issue of girls' education was a, a big challenge uh, to all of us. We've seen progress in the last 25 years, especially, and we were very encouraged and thinking that uh, coming out of Beijing 25, uh, coming out of Nairobi and many other reinforcing uh, normative instruments that we have, we're going to push this goal forward. But COVID has really dealt at a fatal blow. We've heard from Kenya that girls uh, are, are having unplanned and unwanted pregnancy, which means that they will drop out of school. So if I were to choose one thing so that I don't take too much time, it is for all of us to unite to keep girls at school. It is for us to provide the infrastructure to enable them to learn remotely in this time when it is likely that normal schooling is not going to happen for many children in many countries, maybe for two years. So in those two years, so much havoc could happen. We could actually have another lost generation. So investing in infrastructure that allows continuous and learning any place, any time has got to be priority. That is why in UN Women, we have uh, supported the uh, initiative that has been pushed very much uh, by uh, uh, Ireland uh, uh, amongst others, which addresses adolescents' education, addressing the five areas that need to be addressed 
which includes teacher training, infrastructure, etc. But also with UNFPA, with UNICEF, with UNAIDS, we also have been supporting, ensuring that girls can stay at school and finish secondary school. So that is my plea. Whatever you do, put education as one of the critical areas that we're going to support. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam, and uh, good evening to you. And thank you for joining us today. We know that you have another call. Uh, Minister Keita, uh, what kind of political tools we can use to leverage uh, you know, the support and uh, be able to really improve uh, the current situation? Over to you, Minister Keita. Uh, thank you. Uh, the tools are many. The tools are many, but for me at this stage and during this pandemic time, I think the most important thing is to make sure that girls are safe everywhere. So the tools to make sure that this is leverage going on, that's the most difficult thing to do. So one of the things we are taking is to make sure that at the community level, either in town or at a more remote place, to make sure that people visit the homes, people visit to see what is happening in, in the homes. And that is, for the time being, the most important thing. You know, last week, 10 days ago exactly, uh, the president decided to create another ministerial portfolio for the rights of girls and women. So we have a totally independent uh, body now who takes care of that in, in, uh, added to what we do and what uh, social action does. So today, during this pandemic time, most of the schools are still closed. Most of the schools are still closed and we yet need to uh, keep the girls safe. So it's really monitoring in, the, um, in their neighborhood, in their homes, what's happening door to door. It's a very trivial, but that's what we're doing now because rapes are, rates are going high and high, even in my country here. So that's what we do. Today, monitor, make sure the girls are safe everywhere because this is not the case everywhere for time being in my country. Thank you. Thank you so much, TNA, for also reminding us the call from the Secretary General in uh, you know, the peace in the home, peace in the home. And what you're saying is that we can also support uh, this process by monitoring more closely. Thank you. Baroness said very quickly, uh, what do you think is key to laying the groundwork for a more just and equal future for adolescent girls after COVID-19 and beyond? Thank you. Like Diane and Madam Fanzeli, uh, my first one is girls' education. We know that investing in girls' education has an intergenerational impact. Uh, the UK government stands firmly for 12 years of quality education for every girl in the world, and I'm delighted to be the special envoy for girls' education. So really committed to driving that forward. We know, as we've heard, the challenges which COVID is bringing adolescent girls. We must learn lessons from the past. We saw after Ebola in Sierra Leone, the increase in teenage pregnancies. We've got to make sure as, as schools reopen, that girls go back to school, but also that they can continue in the remote learning, which we've seen. So we're committed to furthering that. And the second area I think is really important is accountability. And the Nairobi summit was a really important moment to accelerate action on SRHR globally. Lots of impressive commitments there. Uh, and it was great to see the IPPF this week publishing a really helpful report and database that analyzes all the Nairobi commitments to make sure that we're all fulfilling them. And um, we need to make sure that those who lack political will or, or those who even attempt to restrict rights are held to account. And we need good data to do that. And adolescents are too often not counted. Uh, and adolescents themselves are absolutely key to accountability, as we've seen from Ms. Donna and Reem today. Uh, we need to invest in women's rights organisations, in young people's advocacy. It's a really critical part of accountability. Uh, the UK uh, funds Amplify Change and the Safe Abortion Action Fund and other organisations to support that. But looking ahead, to end on a positive note, there's a real opportunity. You know, the Generation Equality Forum will have adolescence as a cross-cutting theme. So each of the action coalitions will include a focus on that. Uh, the UK is hosting the G7 next year and will also shine a light on the importance of women and girls' rights. And we have less than 10 years left to meet the global goals. So frankly, accountable action for adolescent girls is, is not a nice to have. It's absolutely essential. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable. Uh, I would like to uh, call uh, Madame Shebesh, Honorable Shebesh, please, uh, can you share a little bit of your imagination and future in Kenya? How do you see that for adolescent girls? Thank you very much. Um, it's good to be given some to opportunity to say what your vision is, what your dream would be for the young girls. And uh, of course, we dream big for them. Uh, since we started uh, working around the work of gender, uh, gender and women empowerment, we always focused on the young girls. And uh, Corona has taught us about the vulnerability, but we already knew that vulnerability. So just to repeat that we put measures in place to safeguard these girls, especially because we want their growth to be beyond just education, which we are 100% committed to because we have 100% transition uh, to secondary school. But beyond education, a young girl needs to know that she's worth it. And so through the members of parliament, association and many women who we have approached who are in academia and, and other professions to mentor girls because we've realized that mentorship is something that is important and that it doesn't happen culturally like it used to be before of course because of technology our youth are always behind their phones and their computer screens but when we were growing up we were always mentored by an auntie your grandmother would talk to you and that is something that we feel we have missed. The other thing that we have done is to teach girls and young people in general about being patriotic and about being committed about your country and your capacity. So our hope is that as we continue with these partnerships that we have, that the future of our girls must remain bright. And that as we fight for space right now, what the girls are seeing is that they can achieve. When they look at the women elected, for example, as governors, as members of parliament, women who have been appointed in the cabinet, they do believe that they, that also is something they can inspire to. So for me and for our ministry, what we look forward to doing over the time is to make sure that our girls feel confident in who they are, to know that they have the right uh, to take care of themselves and to choose and to have their own choices. The, the, the time of girls being chosen for what to do even around their body and their sexuality is something that it can no longer happen. I mean, unless we want to hide our heads in the sand, we need to know that for them to be empowered, we must give them those rights and they're enshrined in the constitution. So I see a bright and prosperous future for our young Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Shabesh. Thank you for your participation. And uh, now Carlos, Youth Coalition on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. Uh, you're part of this action coalition on generation equality. Please tell us your contribution and how you're seeing building back better. Uh, so to start, we are very, very honored uh, to be leading this action coalition together with UNFPA, uh, other civil society members and government representatives. Um, as an organization, we have been adopting a human centered design in our work with adolescents. Uh, their realities now shape the approach uh, that we try to adopt and develop in our advocacy strategies, especially from African countries such as Benin. And this down-up approach ensures that there is like a synergy between what adolescents are experiencing in their daily lives and the narratives that are presented within the high-level advocacy spaces. Uh, but we're not only focusing on that, we're also taking a different approach in autonomy because uh, we believe that this approach needs to be intersectional. We are aware that uh, bodily autonomy is not the same for a transgender girl than for a cisgender one, and that cases of um, collective rape of indigenous girls in Colombia by the National Army are exactly reflections mm -hmm. of layers of systemic discrimination um, that are attached to, to a specific case. And in acknowledging uh, these, uh, this gap, uh, we are reaching uh, goals. Acknowledging these differences it makes us to have a more tailored approach to what we want to do. Um, we want to build also information gathering. We, we know that there is a gap between what science uh, is able to say and what we are able to practice. And as 
as students that the most of us are, we are very interested in, in closing that gap of what we are studying with what we can actually practice. Uh, this week during AIDS 2020 and also the HLPF, there are millions of young people advocating for these notions like within the spaces. And um, yeah, we want to let the world know that autonomy for us is not anonymous and it has the name and face of all the girls and young women that need our work. And uh, we don't want to raise voices through our channel, but rather create that channel for them to speak out and for them to raise their own voice and uh, have a shot of life in education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. So um, now, uh, Hans, uh, please, uh, can you just, uh, as former parliamentarian, uh, what do you see as a role of parliamentarian in all this? Thank you. Thank you. I strongly believe that parliamentarians can play an essential role. And, and actually, I think all of us should uh, expect our parliamentarians to be strong champions for the empowerment of all women and girls. And first of all, uh, I believe that parliamentarians need to listen specifically to adolescent girls and raise their experience uh, to ensure that policies and laws respond, respond to their diverse needs. Uh, this is even more important right now in a time of a global pandemic to prevent national lockdown measures and policies from limiting access to important information and services like abortion care, contraceptives and comprehensive sexuality education. I also believe that we need to realize that the, a return to normal after COVID-19 will not be enough to guarantee the health and rights of all girls. And our governments have already made important promises and commitments to women and girls in Cairo, in Beijing, in Nairobi. And parliamentarians now have a unique role in holding the governments accountable and ensure that the commitments are now translated into national action. And I would also like to say that in a time of polarization, when the dialogue between governments uh, on health and rights of women, girls, and LGBTQI persons has become more difficult. I strongly believe that parliamentarians can play an important role in building broad alliances and depoliticize sexual and reproductive health and rights. For if it's something I take with me from my years as a parliamentarian, uh, I would say it is that these, the important issues that we have discussed today are not questions about being conservative, socialist or liberal. It's not questions about being in power or in opposition. It is questions about fundamental and universal human rights. Thank you, thank you so much, Hans. And uh, we are going now to conclude by uh, a few remarks by uh, Natalia Kanem, Executive Director of UNFPA. Uh, Natalia, the floor is yours for a few remarks. In, uh, in launch of the actual coalition. Well, thank you so much. You know, we've had a lot to think about during our conversation today. And the question, what's next, was on my mind when UNFPA uh, volunteered to co-lead the Action Coalition on bodily, bodily Autonomy and Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. I think all of you have really made clear why it's so crucial. Um, we've heard that the mandate from ICPD in Cairo and Beijing 25 years ago. Those agendas go hand in hand, it's true. And now I think we have an opportunity to build on all of the momentum, all of the energy that we took on the road to, to Nairobi and then within Nairobi, and then now on to this year. We've had over 1000 commitments that were uh, emerging out of the Nairobi summit. And that feeds into what we're doing with generation equality. And the adolescent girl is at the center of that. We've heard from the Baroness and from others that the clock is ticking, but we're not gonna give up on this next 10 years. It's the decade of action. And to make that real, Catalos and others have put on the table, young people have to tell us, what do they wanna lead on? Where are they going and how can we help? For UNFPA, I'm certain, that all of our staff, and we're in over 150 locations all around the world, channeling our knowledge, our experience. Thank you so much to uh, Honorable Madame Shabesh from Kenya for explaining how you're doing it. And yes, we can learn from this. 
because in every corner of the world, there are issues that relate to bodily autonomy, the right to choose. So concrete actions, that's what our Action Coalition on Bodily Autonomy is gonna be about. And we do intend to uphold the principles of sexual and reproductive health and rights, which should not be controversial. We need to understand that the human body is part of the sacred intimacy of life and this should not be subverted through ignorance of an adolescent girl to uh, use her for purposes of others. She's got her own life and she's got her own rights. I'm looking forward to working with the other co-leads. We do have a very exciting group and we will also be co-creating around these concrete actions. How are we going to unite? I would like to see gender transformative change, challenging, whatever it is that's the barrier that's in the way of that girl, of that woman's ability to make her own decision. Part of my worry is we've studied this. We've brought the evidence that shows that only 57%, less than 60% of women told us that they could make their own decisions in the 52 countries we studied. They cannot make, we're meaning that almost 40% cannot make their own decision about sexual relations, about whether they're gonna walk out of the house and go to the market or to the clinic, contraception, healthcare, all of this is a major problem. It's time for us to join to get rid of these gender stereotypes that are holding the world back, not just economically, but also the freeing of the mind. And this is again why against my will, our landmark uh, uh, state of world population report this year, brings out three factors that we can all certainly help to change by 2030. Getting rid of child marriage, and we had a very eloquent, powerful speaker on that. Making sure that female genital mutilation comes to an end. And thank you to everybody who's all hands on deck for that. And the fundamental issue of preferring a son over a daughter, this happens in every country every day. It just happened five minutes ago. And why we need to examine why this boy preference when the precious adolescent girl gets set aside has happened already, you know, well before her 18th birthday. So we wanna prepare her for what's coming. Finally, I think I will say that um, policy plays a role. And we've heard from everyone um, who works in that realm that what we wanna do is lift the policy off the page and put it in that village, in that community, in that country and in the world. According to UNFPA projections, by the year 2050, we are looking to have more than two thirds of the population globally living in countries with low fertility. And as governments pursue policies to boost fertility rates, it's also critical that those policies be developed with gender equality in mind, with women's rights at the center. COVID has dealt us an unexpected challenge. It's magnified, as we've heard, the great inequalities of our time, but I think we're using our insights. We are bringing together our resolve to say that we have a role to play in righting the wrongs. These are things that may have continued for generations on end, but we absolutely can chart a more equal path forward. Together with member states, with civil society partners, with academics, with young people themselves. UNFPA looks forward to putting our institutional weight behind making this action coalition on bodily autonomy and SRHR a game changing force for women and girls everywhere. So thank you once again, for those of you who shared your experience online, as well as for what you're going to do in the real world. Bring your passion, bring your energy, bring your smarts, and bring your willingness to fight for the rights of another human being so that we make generation equality a reality. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Natalia. And uh, once again, thank you to all the participants. Thank you to the viewers in YouTube. You know, we are not hearing you, but I hope that the chat is running and we are counting on you in this next, you know, the next, the next decade of action, you know, each of us counts. 
Thank you for the fruitful discussion. Thank you for all the panelists. Thank you for the interpreter, sign language, and different language, French and Spanish. Thank you for joining us today. I mean, we have the power to decide the stories that get told is better. We need to have a better story to tell to the next generation. We will get up every morning with determination <laughs> to our jury, yes. our adolescent girls are safe. Um, power. I also just wanted to add, Nafi, that the comments about the role of culture and music and self-validation were quite beautiful. It's important yes. to understand that the spite is also in the realm of the heart. And so thank you for bringing the musical touch uh, to GK Junyi and to everyone who listened uh, with such joy to have that as a part of our discussion today. Back to you, sure. Nafi. Thanks. Thank you so much. So what's next episode number four will be once again, we shall overcome COVID-19 and people of African descendants on July 23rd. So don't miss it. Thank you and have a wonderful day, evening, night. Bye.